Good morning to each of you. Our service will be a little different this morning and as far as the song service. And we're going to ask that we sing number 197. It's just a short chorus. But to get everybody, uh, you might say, seated real good, we'll just ask if you're able, want to stand on this, then we'll have prayer. And then our choir is going to sing some patriotic songs. 197, if you will, Abel, please stand. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May we bow for prayer. Our Father, as we are here today in your house, we give thanks to you for everything that we have received, beginning with our life, as well as our country, our church, and especially our salvation in Christ. Bless the songs that will be sung, and we pray that you may have our hearts in tune with you, because we know that Christians are needed in this time as the salt and light of the earth. For we ask these sayings and pray your blessings upon our efforts in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
misery more righteous or our land more bountiful? When we stop to think about it, it's easy to see why America has been so blessed. The simple truth is that God has been good to us and all we have has come from Him.
Well, we'd like to invite you to turn to number 681. 681, and if you're able, we invite you to stand and give the choir an opportunity to return to their seats. 681. We'll sing the first and last verse, 681. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for in prayer, please. Father, thank you very much for the blessings that you have bestowed upon our country down through time. You know that early on these blessings were provoked by the faith and the respect and the worship of our founding fathers and families, uh, the worship of you. But unfortunately, as time has gone by, you know, Father, our nation has drifted. The turmoil, the struggles, the violence, the corruption that we see in our government and throughout our society is relative to the drifting that is happening spiritually. You can look at your houses today and see there's very few people interested to come. No love, no care for you. But yet if there were things of the flesh that would be appealing, they couldn't have enough seats to hold everybody. So there is that direct relation. I pray, Father, we would see that. And as children of yours, maybe we, may we be witnesses unto others about this uh, tremendous concern. And may we encourage people to return to you. Bless the service today. May your will be accomplished through it. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, Beth, for putting a hammer down on that song. It's a good song. It would be a wonderful thing if we could really get a greater glimpse of God, how good he is, how great he is. You know, church is the best place to really start on that. It doesn't have to be the ending of it, but I hope this morning that all of us can really get a little closer in our thinking to God. We're at a milestone in our country. I'm sure all of us are aware of things as they are. And I think just to try to summarize it, that we're to love what God has given us, we're to think deeply of it, we're to be very appreciative of it. All that he's done for us, all that he's promised us, and yet, it, like the psalmist says, we're to hate every false way. And so God's people need to have a clear-cut position in our world in which we live. And that's the only way that lost people are going to stop and think, maybe I need something. Maybe there's something that I don't have because this person is different. This person has a testimony. They have a reason. And so it's a time for God's people to stand up. It's a time for God's people to live the life that God wants us to live. We're going to ask you to turn to Psalm chapter 51. Our message tonight is going to switch to the spiritual, or this morning, is going to switch to the spiritual, and that is the soul's cry for freedom. Uh, we know that nature cries for freedom, and that's wherever you go across the globe, that cry is there, but we want to read this 51st Psalm because it is a soul crying out for freedom from the guilt of sin. In Psalm 51 and verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before thee. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and might be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, and build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks unto thine altar. My wife showed me a picture yesterday. It was a doctor, and he was, of course, a convert from abortion. And he held his hand up like this, and there were two little feet in there. They were only like uh, an inch long, something like that, maybe shorter than that, but they were fully formed. And of course, those are the kind of lives that are being pitched in the garbage can. I want to look at verse 5 for just a moment. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Human life begins at conception. From that point on, David said, I was an I and a me and a my at my conception. He said, I was shapen and my mother conceived me. In uh, Luke chapter 1, 
We're just, uh, this is just a point to be made before we get into our message, but it's in the text. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus was Jesus when he was conceived in the womb. He wasn't Jesus at some other point that he happened to jump in to this flesh. But he was Jesus when he was conceived in the womb. In verse 36, Behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, which is called barren. So here is a six-month-old unborn baby. But look down to uh, verse 41. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the six-month-old babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And in verse 44, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the six-month-old babe leaped in my womb for joy. John the Baptist, six months old, he was able to rejoice in the fact of Christ having been conceived into a virgin's womb. In Psalm chapter 139, in Psalm chapter 139, and uh, we're going to read these verses and move on from this, but in verse 15 of Psalm 139, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the, of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God knows the person from the moment of conception on. Even before the body is formed, the scripture says that God knew and saw his person. So those are just some thoughts, and I wanted to bring those out because this is a very hot topic in our time. And sad to say, a lot of good people are being swayed in the wrong direction, and I hope that you're not. Now, getting back to our text, in Psalm chapter 51, this is... Uh, David, in his, his confession, we'll get into his experience in just a little bit. But the one thing I want to point out in the beginning, David did not do the one thing he did not do in his reasoning or in his repenting or in his confession. He did not try to shift the blame somewhere else. He did not do that. You know, if he would have done that, that still would not have cleansed his soul. His guilt would have still been there, and he would have still have known that guilt. In confessing his sin, it was all, if, if you notice in those verses, it was I, me, mine, and my. 37 times in there. Never it was her. It was me. I, he confessed his sin. God holds the soul responsible for sin. Ezekiel 18, 4 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God deals with us based on what is on our souls, not how we can manage things in the eyes of other people. We all have guilty souls by nature and deed. We're all under condemnation. And I just want to read a scripture on this in Romans chapter 5 as we think about the universal condition of mankind. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In verse 18, verse 18, Therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous salvation is just as universal as far as man's need is and man's need goes back to adam 
And so God in his infinite wonder, in his infinite wisdom, even before he ever created man, he made the provision for man's salvation. God justifies the repentant believer by what he sees in his provision that he's made for that sinner. When the sinner accepts God's provision, God goes to that provision and justifies the sinner based on that provision, which is Jesus Christ. That's why salvation is not by works. It's not by baptism. It's not by anything that we can accomplish. It's all based on the provision God made. And that's where God goes to when he receives a sinner who comes to him for salvation. So as we think about David's situation again, David, in his, uh, his confession, and of course this confession is thoroughly made perfect by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so this is not a misspeaking on his part at all. But <clears throat> he was not trying to fix his problem in the eyes of man. At this point, he was seeking to free his soul from guilt. And it was his guilt within that was depriving him of inner cleanness and joy. And only God can cleanse the soul. You know, there is nothing you and I can do to cleanse our souls. There is no effort that we can make. And just making it right in the eyes of other people doesn't change a thing. It's got to be done by God. And, of course, he cleanses the soul on his terms. But backing up a little bit now, prior to David coming to this point where he repented and sought God to cleanse him, he had been a genius at fixing the situation in the eyes of other people, he thought. And so I want to look at that a little bit. And going back to 2 Samuel chapter 11, when we pick up on this story, um, even though that he had been a very, uh, a very genius in getting things to kind of look like they were acceptable in the eyes of people, yet he did nothing to fix the guilt upon his soul. In the um, 11th chapter in verse 2 of 2 Samuel, it says, it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, from this point on, moving on from this, David was in the position of power. He was a king. People were not able to talk about what he did. They had to remain absolutely loyal. So he could do this. Having that power, he could do it and never be challenged for it because he was in the place of being a king. So he became a law unto himself now. That's what he's doing, becoming a law unto himself. And so his first attempt to fix the problem was to make it look like the child was not his. And so his Uriah, the wife or the husband of this woman, was out on the battlefield David sent out to the commander-in-chief and said, send him home. I'm going to give him a leave to be with his wife. So he thought that by Uriah coming home and being home, then this would look like the child was Uriah's uh, rather than David's. But that did not really work because the husband was a man of integrity. He said, I'm not going to go down to my house and spend time with my wife. But all of my fellow soldiers are out there with their life on the line. He said, that will just demoralize their thinking. That I would be home with my wife, enjoying myself, and they're out there with their lives on the line. He said, I won't do it. You know, that had to pierce the heart of David a little because <clears throat> he himself, when he was right with God, was a, a very, very high on integrity. 
And I'm sure that he had to feel a strong reproof from that. So that didn't work. So then his next attempt was, and I want to pause for just a moment before we go into the next thing that David did. I want to read in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, it tells us this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So who can know it? Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And there we'll begin reading in verse 1. 2 Samuel 12, 1. The Lord sent Nathan unto David. He came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up and nourished it, or nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink, drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. All right, what was happening? David's heart was deceiving him, and he didn't even recognize it. He was the guilty one. He knew what guilt was. But he had been deceived by his own heart to where he didn't even realize, it's me. It's me. So as he made the next attempt, I wanted to point that out to uh, sort of get across why in the world can a person do all these things. Well, his heart just was off on the wrong course right now. And so back in 2 Samuel 11 and verse 15, the next thing David did to fix the problem was to use the military. And that is people die every day in war. And people that get killed in war are heroes. So why not make Uriah a hero? And so he ordered Uriah to be put in the front of the battle to assure that Uriah would be killed. Then Uriah would be a war hero, and David would then be free to take his wife unto himself. It's fixing the problem. You know, <clears throat> I'm sure that in his mind, as you go over to verse 26 and 27, that after Uriah's wife had mourned and he was buried, and the morning was past, David sent and took her and fetched her to his house. She became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done just pleased the Lord. Now let's try to put ourselves where David's at. David was a man of God, but here he got way off track from God. And so at this point in his mind, he's probably, no doubt, proud of himself that he has been able to fix all these things. And everything that he's done up to this point, nobody would be able to come back on him because look what he's done. He's given this poor widow woman and her child a royal home. You talk about a good guy. I mean, how much better could you be than to do that? But I want you to think about this for just a moment. Think about what this would grow into if David was to go on in his state of mind. His mind would be, I can do what I want to do because I'm smart enough to control the outcome. Even if it's breaking God's commandments, which he did, 
even if it's playing with other people's lives, I can do this because of who I am and what I have at my disposal. Brother Fight used to write letters home when he was on the mission field about his troubles, about the oppositions that he would run into, and he would always close these letters with two words, but God, but God. And you know, you can take all this that David has lined up to fix the problem, but God. The Lord sent Nathan to David. You know, you can't get by God. No way can we get by God. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30, it says, The Lord shall judge his people. Being saved, David had a spiritual life as well as his natural life. And God spoke to his spiritual life through his prophet Nathan. And God revealed to David what he had done. And he judged David according to his privilege and opportunity, as well as other factors involved. You know, the Bible says, Unto whom much is given, much is required. And be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. So I want to begin reading in 2 Samuel 12, verse 7. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee my master's house, thy master's house, and thy master's wives under thy bosom, gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain with him slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. He shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this saying before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this great or this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David repented, and David confessed his sin, as you see in the 13th verse, and God forgave him. You know, that raises a question, why? Well, Jesus Christ was going to pay for that penalty, and in God's plan, his foreordained plan, it was already as paid for as if it had happened. You can read Romans chapter 3 on that. You know, when uh, Christ was foreordained to die for the sins of man, in the Old Testament, people who would believe that that was going to happen, they had the same salvation that we have as we look back to it already have happened. So David's sins, the penalty, was paid for by Christ. So uh, that's the reason God for could forgive him and did forgive him. However, verse 9 and 10 David, there's a harvest. The harvest is the sword is never going to depart from your house. You're going to have things from here on that's going to be a problem for you. And then in the 14th verse, he told him, because what you have done has given the enemies of God a cause to blaspheme, the child that's born unto thee shall die. In other words, there's additional judgment due to the effects of what you have done. So it wasn't just a matter that they would have to deal with it. It was a matter that David was going to be held responsible for it. So even though God forgave David, there was more work to be done for David's restoration. Because not only is there guilt for sins committed, which can only be atoned for by the blood of Christ, 
But there is also the effects that sin has upon the person himself. And that's what we find about in Psalm 51. In the third verse of Psalm 51, it says, I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is ever before me. Some things you've got to live with them. Even though that you can get forgiveness for them, you still have to live with it. And so, by God's grace, we can, but it's there. And so don't ever think that you can just go out here and sin, and then when you reach a point where, boy, it's tough on me, I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and everything's going to be good. No, you're going to have to live with what you do. So that's something that's there. And then in verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So there are some things you can never justify why you did it. Just have to admit I was wrong. And <clears throat> try to teach others, don't do this. And emphasize the importance of doing what's right because some things you just cannot ever put a white flag on. Uh, they're just not going to happen that way. But yet, even though they can be stains upon your life, they can also be learning experiences that you can help others with. And you yourself can be more devoted as a result of having learned. Now there is also the matter of our standing with God. In verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. It don't matter what we say, how we say it, or how good it sounds, God still responds to what he sees in the heart. So a person might put up a great speech, but God, he looks on the heart. He sees what's there. Only God can relieve the soul of the effects that our sin have upon us. You notice in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Only God can correct and connect our minds to really comprehend and appreciate spiritual matters. Because he says, then I'll hear joy and gladness, and then uh, I can rejoice again. Because God can get things right in the mind as well. And then in verse 9, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. The soul of a person can never be satisfied until one knows that God has accepted their plea for forgiveness. And once you know that God has accepted your plea because in your heart you really mean it, why then your soul will be satisfied. There can be no peace in the soul until there is peace with God. So in verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. To be right with God, you know, you have to do all that you can do to alleviate what you have done wrong. I uh, thought of Zacchaeus in the 19th chapter of the book of Luke. When Zacchaeus came down out of the tree and received Christ joyfully, the first thing that came to his heart was he had been a tax collector. He was a tax collector. And the way the tax collectors earned their living, if you owed the government $100, they would squeeze you for 150 So they got the 50 And so a lot of them got pretty rich because they were pretty persuasive. So Zacchaeus said, if I have taken anything from any man, I'm going to give it back to him fourfold. He wanted a clear conscience. And so that, to be right with God, you know what you've got to do. You've got to make things right that you have made wrong. There was a preacher, Brother Huffman. Uh, I'm surprised I remembered his name. But he was the preacher that Brother Gardner was saved under back in Kentucky many years ago. I'm sure all of you probably recall the 40s and the 50s. But anyway, um, he had had a lady in the church. Brother Huffman had had a lady in the church. 
and had given him all kinds of problems. And uh, so he left that church and went to another church in, a, in a, another ministry. So one day somebody came by and said, Hey, Brother Huffman, that, and he named the lady, the one that gave you all the trouble, why, she got everything right. She's right with God now. Brother Huffman said, No. He said, What do you mean? If she'd have got things right, she'd have come to me and make things right. Of all she did with me, she would have wanted to make things right if she got things right. So the wrong David had done towards others was really what his guilt was about. So if he didn't make it right, how could the guilt go away? It would not go away. So he wanted to make things right, not just get the heat off of himself. So in the 10th verse, he cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. These are things we cannot fake or produce ourselves. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. A soul touched by divine cleansing wants to serve God. It wants to honor the God that has forgiven and cleansed them. It wants to lift up the truth of God unto others. You know, the, the soul of Saul of Tarsus, when he was saved, it was hungry for this. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? Now in verse 16, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. When you reconcile with God, you don't want it to just be a matter of, you know, sending God roses and making everything look good on the surface. You want it to be a heart matter. It's like if you love somebody dearly and you have hurt that person, you've done something against that person, you just don't want to go and pick some roses out of your neighbor's yard and take them over and give them to them and say, ah, everything's fine. You want to talk to that person. You want to feel in your heart that everything's right with that person. So that's the way it is with God. It's not just something we smooth over with a little you know, this, that, and the other, but it's a heart-to-heart -heart matter. And I want to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 just how deep this really is in the heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then notice how deep this really is. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, Yea, what revenge! In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. There's nothing any more heartfelt than a true reconciliation when a person has made things right with a person they've offended. And I'm sure maybe you've had someone that you've had that experience with. But only when we have a broken uh, we have broken free from our sin and returned to God with all of our heart. Only then is our soul free. So David wasn't just trying to use God to get past some guilt and, uh, you know, being depressed and some fearful state of mind. He really wanted. He really wanted what it was to be right with God. He really wanted to have the closeness with God himself to where that he could be used of God. Why? He loved the Lord. 
You know, when I was uh, a young man, I was saved in 1954 at the age almost 10, but always in church. Mom and dad always kept us in the house of God, a good sound Bible preaching church. And I would see people, they would come forward in church, blah, 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 all over the preacher. And man, you would think that they just loved everything, loved the world. Go on a few years and then they're gone. They're gone. They're gone for a few years and finally they come back and do the same thing over and over again. And I wondered, what is going on? Because that's not the way it is. And you know what I came to realize? The love for God wasn't really there. It was about them. It was about their feelings. It was about the way they were looking at things. You don't do that to God when you love him. And so that's the reason David's where he's at. He loved the Lord. And he wanted things to be right with God. And so he poured out his heart unto God. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. God knows who loves him. And because David loved God, his own heart was greatly troubled when he woke up to the fact of how much he had sinned against the Lord. He wanted his soul to be free of his guilt. You know, Christ said in John 8, 32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. David did what was necessary to be free. He responded to the truth. And you know, you and I are going to need our soul cleansed, not only in salvation, but we're going to need it cleansed of our guilt because we're not going to get through life without guilt. And God shows us how we can do it. And boy, what a blessing it is. God bless you with his word. Father, we pray you'll take your word this morning. We know that you want every soul to be clean. You do not want your children to be at odds or at difference with you or with one another. And therefore, you have made the means whereby we can make things right. We humble ourselves. If we turn from our sin, if we confess our sin, we repent, we have a change of mind. We know that you're there and you will forgive and you will restore as that is the chosen desire of the person. How grateful we are for your amazing grace that you extend to us in spite of our unworthiness. We pray if there's someone here this morning that has never trusted you to be known publicly, we pray that their response might be according to your will. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.